So you, you've mentioned um, going to Hollywood yep. and your, your colleague over there and living in his house. What, what's the Hollywood experience like for you? How did you find it? Uh, extremely interesting. Very, very exciting at first, obviously, because I went there in 1972. I hadn't been there before. Um, so it was a brand new experience uh, to go there. So I was excited about it. Um, I learned a lot of things technically there. Um, but I also learned a lot of things about how the system worked, some of which I really liked and some of which I didn't. The system, uh, I call the system, they're, they're, they're very, very um, hierarchical, I suppose, is the word for it. Everybody knows their place. No one speaks out of place in the, in the, in the theatre, no one at all. There would be a chief dubbing editor, his assistant, the editor, maybe his assistant, the director's there, perhaps the producer, um, and they all know exactly when to talk. This was at a time before um, any really clever stuff. If you wanted to move a track, for instance, you actually went upstairs and cut it on the dubber. If someone said, oh, uh, I want that uh, motorbike to start four seconds later, one guy just stood, no one spoke, Exactly four seconds, yes, bomb, and he was gone. He was the assistant dubbing editor. He went upstairs, they rolled the thing past the, they ran up past the head, he marked four feet, they ran down, he cut that four feet out, the spacing, put the four feet back in, rushed back and sat down. Like that, and I thought, Christ, it's the army. <laughs> you know? and, and, uh, but a couple of times someone spoke out of turn, and that, that wasn't any good at all. Some, and, he, and the guy who, who spoke wanted to, he wanted to help, but it wasn't his, it wasn't his part, you know? So I, 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 I thought that was a bit... So it was efficient, but you, you didn't like that approach? Well, it wasn't Aussie. Like, if I'd say, Phil, can you do that for me, mate? I would do this or something, you know what I mean? Or, absolutely. And, and the American crews that came out here noticed that, by the way. So that was very hierarchical, and I didn't like that. But how good they were at doing it was fantastic. And they were happy to be what they were. There was a guy there, um, his name was um, Red Roddy. I remember because there was a football radio called Rod Reddy at the time, <laughs> rugby league player. But this fellow was Red Roddy. And he sat in, this, in the room where they were recording and he listened on earphones to the entire mix, the entire day. The slightest dropouts he would know, and when there was a stop, he would say, uh, John, worried about something at, you know, in that scene, they'd play it. He listened to the whole thing. He laced up everything as well, and he said, I said, do you ever get sick? No, no, I don't get sick of it. He said, this is my job, and I'm very good at it, and I'm determined to be the best at it. Just licking, listening for dropouts and little problems. Laced, lacing everything? and then listening. Mm. That was the entire day. I found that people who did, uh, uh, one guy did the optical transfer. They transferred the optical sound onto film. That's all he ever wanted to do. He wanted to be the best he could possibly be at it. They had no ambitions to move beyond that Exactly, station. exactly. Well, I found that very interesting, you know? And they were, they were middle-aged guys. I was out, I mixed a picture, several pictures for a bloke who I didn't think especially was especially good. And he said to me one day, he said, I can't understand why you keep mixing. I said, why? He said, don't you want to, don't you want to move on to something else? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, I don't understand that. Well, what, said, what would there be to move on to once you're, you mix at the top of that heap, really, of the sound department? I think he thought, post. I thought he thought making my own movies or something, you know? And he, and he said, um, and he sort of intimated that I should be t going on from there because the mixing wasn't where you should stop, you know what I mean? Mm. And I said, well, I could always be a crook director. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In a conversation. I've worked with <laughs> enough of them, I know what it's like. <laughs> well, I met him, you know. Mm. Um, but that, but they, that, was, that was an interesting thing. Um, also there, they were, it seemed very laid back. People seemed very, 
you know, hi John, how are you? Good, good Phil, how was the weekend? Thing, thing. This is Peter from Australia. Peter, nice to meet you. Everything was really relaxed and coffee, yeah. Man. But if someone stepped out of line, they just crushed him. Mm. And when I went to Hollywood and had that blue with the director who was not a Hollywood man, William Holden was in that picture and he said, he came to me and he, he, he really apologised to me because I had an argument with the director about one of the lines he was doing and he wasn't doing it very well. And he came to me and he said, oh, I'm sorry, mate, call me mate, sorry, mate. I said, don't worry about it, mate. I said, in Hollywood, this argument would stop my career. Where I come from, it'll be a good story and a lot of good pubs. And it's true. And it was for a long time. Mm. So you don't regret not doing a lot of work in Hollywood? You're happy to have done most of it here? Oh, yeah. But, but I'm, not, I'm not knocking them, but, but it, it, it just was... Everybody really had to know their place, you know? When they treated me like... They la I had a fantastic time because I knew Dave and, and I was a real... I mean, this whole thing about the Baza McKenzie thing, like say something in Australia, that was happening in Hollywood in the, in the 70s. People were asking me, a lot of them didn't know where Sydney was. I mean it. And, and they would, they'd ask you about kangaroos and things all the time. It's hysterical. Mm. There was one guy, I mean, this mightn't be, you might need this, it mightn't be relevant. One guy said to me, we had a, a picture here called The Boyfriend. And he said, it didn't do very well here. That's the English musical? Yeah. yeah. He said, they were talking about a handsome cab, he said. <laughs> what American knows what a handsome cab is? And I said, why does it matter? Was it on the screen? Yeah. Well, well that's what it. it was, you know. Yeah. But they were, I've, I found them, I'm not trying to knock them, I found them um, extremely interested in what they were doing, but outside of that, they weren't very interested. Um, but, I, but they treated me really well, and I, I do like American people. My daughter's lived in America for 13 years now, in um, Tucson, Arizona. So what's, and you've, met, you've touched on this a bit, mm. when Americans came here to work, mm. to work with you and to work on our films here, um, how... Has it been their perception of our approach to the way we work and make films? Well, a, a few of my were very excited about how everybody pits in together, particularly on location. I mean, on location there, no one carried the cameraman's bag except the cameraman, even if it was very heavy or something. Whereas out here, let's go, mates, you know, you're making a movie. Hmm. And, I, and, and I think that's ch that may well have changed a lot now, but I, the people that came out here early, and the English people too, were really, really taken with how much teamwork there was in the Aussies. It wasn't just, that's his job, don't touch it. You know what I mean? Mm. I, think, um, I think later on uh, the unions changed that a bit, that you, that you had to have more people doing certain things and so on. But well, we didn't care as much about OHNS back then. No, of course, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it shocking? Back when we were making oh, Mad Max and those sort of yeah, films. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but... But I did, I, I enjoyed Hollywood, um, except that I, I also got this feeling uh, that there was, um, probably because I'd, I'd had to mix a picture in two weeks, they were a bit too relaxed, some things took too long to do. I was, I was sitting there thinking, I'd love to tell this guy to, to try this, you know, but I'm not going to tell him. Did they have the luxury of more time and money? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and eventually, that matters to how you operate. Not, not, it's, not just, it's not just good you got it because you need it. It's sort of just good because you got it. And, and I reckon often, in all, in all sort of uh, walks of life, if people have got too much time or too much money uh, to do a job with, they take the time and they use the money. So it, it, we were, we were, as I say, I keep saying the same thing, but it's a fact. Because we were so excited about what we're doing, we all want to do it as great. And we want to do it within the budget, so everybody's happy, not just the... And you make it work. Sure. One way or another, you make sure. it work in two weeks, or sure. one week, sure. if you're working for Ghanaian. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>